Hi, Matt. Um, yeah, so when hi, we... Hi, Pete. When, <laughs> hi, man. Cheers. I'm going to get told off. I get told off sometimes in the comments for drinking. Um, yeah, so when we book the Airbnbs, the first thing we look for is the table. We go through all of them. Is that a good table? When we find a good table. Yeah, because you can't travel with something like this. So be... <laughs> you imagine I just turned <laughs> up with a table on your back. I mean, I thought the flex might be that you just bought the table. Uh, that would be a flex. Just show up in a new town, buy the table, leave <laughs> six days later. <laughs> leave the table with them. Do we leave? Do we ever leave stuff? We printer. We've left a printer. We've left a printer. That's it. But no, no. We luckily um, most houses these days come with tables. It's like a fair enough. It's like a standard thing, like <laughs> tables and chairs and <laughs> knives and forks. So uh, there you go. Yeah, man. Uh, we're gonna be uh, we're working on a fixed location now. Fuck yeah. Yeah. And there's. Uh, I know you want me to come to Nashville because. You're talking about a lot last night. A fixed location in America. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I've got a location in the UK, the Bedford Stadium. No, I would. I mean, I wouldn't do it there. <laughs> I would not do it there. <laughs> that would take the production down. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's going to end up being uh, a UK and US, and we'll just sense. Have, just one in the US, and we won't travel around anymore. It gets a bit easier. Anyway, man, how are you? Well, anyway, you should do that in Nashville. Consider it. It's it's tempting. It's tempting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like the people I mean, in Nashville. I mean, Austin would be a better fit for you because it's it's more crypto friendly. <laughs> it's just how we start. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's fucking go. Shots fired. Shots fired. Well, I don't know. We're, we're drinking this delicious whiskey. I just wanted to thank you for this whiskey. Don't thank me. Who bought it? Do you buy it? I bought it. Thank Danny. Thank you, Danny. You're welcome. Are you going to charge me for it? Yes. Okay, then thank <laughs> me. Uh, yeah, fuck you, firstly. And uh, uh, No, I like Austin. There's a lot of people I like there, but I think... Yeah, there's a great crew. But, Austin's very strong. But Nashville has a very strong group of people. It's not a competition. You can't go wrong. Uh-uh. It is a competition. They're both strong. It's, it's like choosing between children. It's very hard. Not always, I would, actually, I would sometimes. Hope, I would hope choosing between children is more difficult. Sometimes it isn't. I wouldn't know yet. Yeah. Hoddle knows what I mean by that. Uh, how, was, uh, how was Oslo? Oslo was fucking awesome. I had so much FOMO. Yeah, you were missed. I mean, I've been working with HRF. Yeah, so in Oslo, is the Human Rights Foundation Freedom Forum. Um, I've been working with HRF now for almost three years with training their activists on how to use Bitcoin. And every year... Uh, Alex Gladstein, the chief strategy officer, gets more and more of the content focused on Bitcoin. So this year, maybe 80% was human rights stories, and then 20% was the fi- financial freedom track, is what they were calling it. Yeah. And then of that financial freedom track, like 80% was Bitcoin. Uh, so there's a great crew of Bitcoiners there. All my work with HRF is always a super humbling experience. It always reminds you you know, why this mission is so important, why people need better money, uh, why people need better privacy, and just digital privacy and digital sovereignty in general. Um, so their stories are always extremely touching. It's great to actually work with them hands on. We did clinics, we did, um, you know, workshops where we trained them how to install their first Bitcoin wallet, receive Bitcoin, send Bitcoin back up, restore. Uh, then we went into depth on privacy. And it's just always extremely rewarding. It's probably the single I mean, I do a lot of things in Bitcoin, but it's the single most rewarding thing I do. If I if I had, if if I was just going to drop everything except for one thing, that would probably be the thing that survived. I mean, it doesn't pay the rent. I did it all for free, so that's not going to happen. But in that theoretical <laughs> yeah. world, you know, Bitcoin at a million dollars, that's all I would do. A big shout out to Alex Gladstein as well. It's a really important layer of work he's doing, um, often out on his own. At times early on, trying to fight for Bitcoin on the human rights side of things and push it to like influential and important people who cover human rights. And uh, uh, he's done some great work over the last few years. I've, I think I've been to four of their events now. That was the first one I missed. I was really gutted to miss it. Gutted just because usually you see some really great humbling talks, but actually there's like a growing core of Bitcoin as a go to these events. And I was just like seeing all the pictures of my friends. I was like, oh, I wish I'd have been there. But it looked great. Your but, first one was in New York with me? No, I went to one, I think, o- the one I did in Oslo. There was one in Oslo. Before that. This so was I, my first time actually going to Oslo. Yeah, so I did Oslo, New York. I think we then went online, and then I went to the one in Miami. Yeah. Yeah, Miami. It was last year. Yeah, and then I missed this one, but I'll be back next year. And, um, 
I look forward to it. But just a big shout out to Alex. Uh, anyone listening should go and check out everything he does and check out the Human Rights Foundation. Yeah, the whole the whole Oslo Freedom Forum, uh, all those talks are online if you go to oslofreedomforum.com. So everyone should check it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so missed it. Sad. But here we are back traveling. Good to see you again. A couple of things I want to talk to you about. Last time we ripped in person was a lot less professional than this. Uh, it was me with a little trolley. Yeah. Two mics. Zoom. In my apartment in Brooklyn. In your apartment in Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, we drank that day though, didn't we? Yeah. All of our episodes pretty much are just yeah. different <laughs> levels of trash. <laughs> this whiskey is 120 proof, so we got to be very careful. Uh, what does that mean? It means it's 60% alcohol. Okay. That's pretty strong. The proof is double. I don't know why that's even a system and they don't just say 60%, but. Yeah. That, that would be more logical. <laughs> Make more sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there'll be some weird old rule to it. And, and what was the deal with that? Like, um, this was from Prohibition era? I mean, Hoddle said supposedly that this was legal during Prohibition because it was too alcoholic. So it was treated as medicine, like antiseptic. All right. Well, we've got American Hoddle in the room here also. So thank you for that. Uh, okay, uh, Danny, uh, when we were preparing for this show, he said my favorite shows with Matt are the ones where you argue. And naturally we're going to well, We argue. can't manufacture that. Then we're just going to well, we agree would, on everything. We will just argue anyway because you'll get angry when you realize I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is uh, something I did want to talk to you about. There's a few things I want to talk to you about. Uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about is uh, the difference between 21 million and privacy. And What do you mean? I think they serve two very different purposes. I think they're, and they can be a, uh, approached in terms of education differently. And the reason I do that is I think there is a wider macro benefit to the 21 million that can benefit individuals. So when you say 21 million, you mean fixed audible supply? Yeah, that any, anyone can supply. verify how many Bitcoin there are, how many Bitcoin there ever will be? Yes. I think that's very important on a large macro scale, but also to an individual. Once uh, once we get out of these volatile times and it gets liquidity's high and the price stabilizes, I think there's a there's a benefit on a macro level to uh, nations becoming more financially responsible, but also for individuals to be more secure in what they're holding. I think that's one thing, and I think privacy is a separate issue that affects other, some people differently. And I think we have a wide range of people who, who you would argue, and rightly so, should care about their privacy. But I don't think they do, and I therefore think you can tack those edu- in terms of education separately. I want you to tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can really separate the two. Okay. Good money, good money should be able to be spent at will and saved at will. Uh, it, it needs to do both. So, so there's a big disconnect in the Bitcoin community because you have a lot of people that are pure. I guess, fixed supply overall else or, or store of value. There's people that say, you know, Bitcoin is the ultimate asset for savings. And then there's people that say that Bitcoin is digital cash. And then there's a smaller s- subset that's like the Venn diagram of the combination of the two. And that's where I sit, right in, right in the middle, because you can't have one without the other. So ultimately, when we talk about the way Bitcoin works, um, people don't understand why that token exists. Why does the token Bitcoin exist? And the token Bitcoin exists is because the whole point of Bitcoin is to have money that is separate of trusted third parties. And if you have money that's separate from trusted third parties, you need a native bearer token. Because if you don't have a native bearer token, in this case, Bitcoin or SATs, um, you're relying on some kind of issuer to, to, you're, you're trusting that issuer to provide it. So like a good example would be you know, DeFi projects on Ethereum that are using USDC, right? They're not using a native bearer token. So as a result, they're trusting um, Circle and the rest of the USDC consortium like BlackRock and shit um, to to maintain that piece of value. So no matter what, they can never get rid of that trusted third party. So you need the native bearer token. That token needs to have, and that token is used to pay miners um, who are securing the network, right? Without a trusted third party. So miners can just join the network permissionless uh, and receive tokens for the work they provide. That token needs to have some sort of value because if it doesn't have value, then we're not actually sending money around the world, right? Yeah. Need to, the token needs to have value. Ideally, the token increases in value over time, right? 
Some might say that in a perfect world, it would be absolutely stable. But I think the, the, the key value prop is that over time, it shouldn't decrease in purchasing power. You shouldn't, yes. if you hold this thing over 10 years, 20 years, it should go up in value. We come back to censorship resistance. We come back to being able to spend or save without a trusted third party, without permission. And the privacy aspect then affects that censorship resistance. Because if you have Bitcoin that you've saved, and let's say um, it's increased in purchasing power, at some point you want to actually leverage that purchasing power. You actually want to use it. Um, I mean, holding savings is also using, but you're going to actually want to spend it on things that you need, necessities in life. And when that time comes, if you don't have privacy in the system, then you're going to have trusted third parties that are basically going to dictate whether or not you can spend it on what you want to spend it on. And are they going to do that? Potentially. Are they going to do that within the protocol? No, they don't do it within the protocol. They don't have a button they can press to seize your Bitcoin or a button they can press to block your Bitcoin and stop you from spending it. But if they can see how much Bitcoin you have, when you spend it, where you spend it, then they can do the good old fashioned gun to your head and compel you to either not do those activities or punish you if you do those activities. And most people will just fall in line. In that situation, all of a sudden, the value prop of, of holding Bitcoin gets hurt, in my opinion. And then all of a sudden, that store of value property starts to fall apart because if people, if investors or holders or whatever you want to call them, people that are saving money in Bitcoin think they might not be able to spend it in 10 years or 20 years or whenever they need to spend it, then why are they holding it in the first place? Why does it actually have any value? So to me, the whole thing is interconnected. And the beauty of Bitcoin is everything has trade-offs, but the trade-off balances try and get you as close to the best of both worlds as possible. So I agree with you for an ideal best form of money. Um, what I was really coming up with this is that uh, the scenario you're talking about is it's kind of a worst case scenario. It's kind of already happening. We have, you know, 99% of new users are coming in and fully regulated exchanges. All their addresses are known. Mm -hmm. They're not using any privacy tools after the fact. Um, but what I'm saying is that worst case scenario be, where there are guns held your head said you you have to spend this or spend it here. Give it, that's like a worst case dystopian nightmare future. Uh, right now we no, have... No, I mean, look, so I, I'll use two political hot button issues in America. Yeah. Right now... The U.S. government has the capability of telling people you cannot use Bitcoin to buy guns and you cannot use Bitcoin to pay for abortions. And will some people still use it for those things? Yes. But the overwhelming majority of people, if they tried to use it for those two things, it would be obvious. And then they would get punished after the fact. They would end up in court, you know, maybe jail time, maybe fines, however you want to do it. They could do that right now to 99% of the new users who come in because they're just not aware of the privacy trade-offs. And the privacy tools are, they're just, a lot of people aren't using them. The overwhelming majority of people aren't using them. The tools are there. They're better than ever. The education is there. It's better than ever. Um, but there's a disconnect. And I, my optimistic take is that the disconnect is because ultimately Bitcoin is a system without rulers. It doesn't have a top-down uh, command and control structure. So usually the way it evolves and the way users evolve is is they feel pain. And as they get burnt and they feel pain, as the system gets attacked, it gets stronger, more robust. Users learn, they get better. So I expect these sorts of type, these sorts of censorship attacks to happen, external censorship attacks to happen. And then as those attacks happen, then all of a sudden the privacy equation becomes much more um, important, both to individual users, but also to just network participants as a whole. And you think this is the scenario whereby Bitcoin is uh, well distributed, well used, but not necessarily in a hyper Bitcoinization situation. In a scenario where perhaps uh, the state still has a lot of control and hasn't been forced to reduce in size. Look, I mean, Bitcoin's a protocol; anyone can use it. Uh, people can use it however they want to use it. Yeah. Um, no participants can tell another participant how they can or cannot use it. I think in this scenario to me, the concern is, 
I think Bitcoin will be successful. I think it will be the money of the world. Mm -hmm. um, we could end up in a situation that is kind of similar, similar but different, same, same but different mm -hmm. than our current situation where the way elites interact with Bitcoin, the way the ruling class interacts with Bitcoin is different than the way the average person interacts with Bitcoin. So you would see a world where 90% of Bitcoin users are in this fully compliant, controlled system, right? And then you have maybe 5% of people that are essentially criminalized because what they're doing is against their local laws, but they're, they're, they're savvy enough to actually do it. And then you have 5% that is just the wealthy elite who can just do whatever the fuck they want because they have the money and, you know, the laws are made to benefit them and they use whatever legal loopholes like already exist today, right? They have, you know, an Ireland corporation or a Bahamas corporation and it's doing this and doing that and they're keeping it in shell corps and different banks and stuff and they'll have privacy. But the, the average user, the majority of users, the mom and pops, you know, the people that are just working paycheck to paycheck, those people will be in a completely compliant captured system. And at least they'll have a better money that holds purchasing power over time as opposed to the current system. Um, and they have the ability to potentially educate themselves and learn how to opt out. But then essentially they become criminals. It's, they'd be criminalized in terms of that respect, but they'd have that option available to them. So it would be slightly better or maybe even significantly better, but it's not, I don't, I don't think it's the compelling vision that a lot of Bitcoiners, you know, hope to see in the future. Yeah. I, I kind of hope it's not such a dystopian future whereby I'm worried about, I mean, look, there's always going to be certain things that you've, you've listed two edge cases. They're highly relevant to the, to the U S not edge cases that are so relevant, say, to the UK where I am. Well, let's say you're in Iran or something and you're trying to buy oh, no, I understand a this book about gays or something like that, right? Yeah, I, th I think there's different edge cases yeah. per country. The UK will have its own edge cases. But the point I was trying to get to is that uh, I think right now, and this is probably where we'll go, go at it a little bit, I think privacy is hard on Bitcoin. What I mean is when I say it's hard, it's I've been through your tutorials, I've read various things, I always feel like I'm just going to fuck something up here. Somewhere along the line, there's going to be a mistake I'm going to make. I'm, I'm not going to have the right privacy on my node. I'm not going to be using Tor in the right way. Like there's something, there's, there's so many different intricate parts to it that I'm pretty sure I'm going to screw something up. So I've kind of accepted now that I just don't really have it at the moment. It's not that I don't want it. It's not that I don't think anyone should have it. It's just a bit tricky. But at the same time, I can still benefit from the 21 million. I mean, it's yet to be seen if you can benefit from the 21 million because we don't know if you're going to be able to spend it in 10 years. Um, but I mean, that's it. that's in a scenario, therefore. Though, so we still have sovereign cur currencies and Bitcoin is being attacked at a state level because they don't want you to spend it at all. Bitcoin has not been attacked yet, really. It will get attacked more, first of all. Uh, maybe not the U.S., you know, but other other a lot of states will attack it, and it won't just be states. It'll be corporations. I mean, we see today in the digital privacy world, uh, you know, one of the main attackers are these corporations that monetize our data. Right? They monetize all the data: Google, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and they're basically these these corporate surveillance machines. They make a bunch of money off of it, and then they end up partnering with governments or com getting compelled by governments or selling that information to third parties who then do the same. Um, so it will be a bit of a corporate state partnership type of situation. And depending on where you are in the world, it could be different for your threat model. But I just, to go back to what you said, is it's very interesting that you said that because this is not obviously the first time I've heard that. The meme with privacy is always that people say, I'm not concerned because I have nothing to hide. That's not what that, I'm saying. No, I know. One sec. That's not the real thing I hear. What I usually hear is I am so fucked that I'm going to screw something up anyway, so it's not worth me dealing with it, right? And what I would say to that is ultimately this is not just a Bitcoin conversation. This is a digital privacy conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed in the current state that we're in, in terms of our digital tools. You know, everything around us is a panopticon. Everything's spying on us. 
It's all connected. You make mistakes. They last forever. You know, the strides and effect. And you put something on the internet, you're probably not going to be able to get it off. It's even worse with Bitcoin because you have this ledger, the Bitcoin blockchain that should outlive all of us. This immutable ledger that can't be changed. Um, so you hear this a lot and it's completely reasonable to be overwhelmed. But what I would say is little improvements do help. Perfect is not the goal. The goal is not perfect. The goal is to make small improvements. And if you talk about on the privacy side, a perfect example in the privacy on Bitcoin side is taking your Bitcoin off of exchanges and holding self-custody yourself. I do that. Now, is that a massive privacy benefit? No, but obviously it's a better benefit than someone else holding all your keys and knowing every single transaction you make, right? You're taking you're taking a step in the right direction. So, and then if I would say on the digital privacy world, it'd be like unplugging your Alexa. Don't have, you know, a smart home assistant in your house that just has a microphone on all the time. I'm not saying you need to be James, uh, you know, be, uh, what is it, James Bourne? No. James. Jason Bourne. Jason Bourne. You don't need to be like Jason Bourne. You don't have to be like a secret agent. But little things, you know, little little things around your daily life, reducing your reliance on Google, reducing your li- reliance on social media, not have, you know, not sending your DNA to some third party company. Like these things make a significant difference both individually, but at scale, it helps everyone because at scale, you're you're basically you're you're hurting this mass surveillance mechanism that is at place where almost everybody's information is just constantly being sucked up and stored forever. And then it might not be used against us today. It could be used against us in 10 years. It could be used against us in 20 years. You don't know what the situation will be at that point. Yeah, I, I wonder whether it's uh, edge cases that are banned, you've, you've given them, or it's a full-blown attack. They don't want you to spend any Bitcoin. Like holding or spending Bitcoin is considered criminalized, but I think at that point it almost loses the majority of its value. That becomes a really viable scenario. I don't think so. I think, I think once again, Bitcoin it means different things to different people. Of course. Um, I think long term it loses its, its potential, but I think short term, first of all, it's way easier to capture Bitcoin than it is to kill it. Um, every day that Bitcoin survives, it gets stronger. Capturing Bitcoin is relatively easy, and and we, it's not 100% effective, but you can capture a lot of people uh, relatively cheaply, relatively easily. You make an example out of a few people, most will comply. I mean, we saw that with 2020, with all of uh, the COVID responses, stuff like that. We see it. We see it absolutely all the time. Um, so capturing it is easier. Corrupt politicians, rich businessmen can also make money on captured Bitcoin. They really can't on destroying Bitcoin. So I don't think it's going to be a scenario where they actually go for the kill shot, try and kill Bitcoin. And I don't think I don't I, I don't think any government can right now. Maybe maybe if the U.S. government put like everything they had to do it, but they would never do that. That was just that's just not even a, a realistic possibility. But capturing it is happening today. Like I said, ninety nine percent of people are coming in on these KYC regulated on ramps. A lot of them are giving them custody, giving them full ID information, you know, social security number, everything. Fully linked to their ID. So, but there's a group of Bitcoiners that have come in as Bitcoin adoption has increased and they are more corporate, they're more regulatory friendly, right? You always hear the words regulatory clarity. You don't hear government attack on Bitcoin. For those people, Bitcoin becoming more captured could be a buy signal. So as it happens in the short to medium term, Bitcoin can pump on that news. Like there's a there's a bunch of, um, you know, massive institutional funds and rich people who are waiting on the sidelines basically for the all go ahead. You know, you can hold Bitcoin, just don't spend it on anything we say you can't spend it on. And they're already living their lives not spending their things on things they're not allowed to spend it on. So they're cool with that. Price pumps. Bitcoin looks like it's doing really well. But as that's happening, the majority of people are getting captured. Now, in that scenario, when I work it out through my head, I still think Bitcoin becomes the reserve money of the world. I just think it's a more dystopian scenario. And that's why when people say, Matt, like if you care about Bitcoin, if you care about digital privacy, like why is your focus on Bitcoin? where it seems like privacy is maybe a secondary priority or a third priority. 
And the reason is because ultimately it's not up to me whether or not Bitcoin is the successful money of the world. I've come to the conclusion that I think that's going to be the case. So what is the most productive uh, place to focus my time, both for myself and for the movement? Because I'm thinking about myself, but I'm also thinking about my grandkids, right? And I want my grandkids, I don't want them to have cuck money. I don't want them to have fully regulated surveillance money. I want them to have freedom money. I want them to have money that they can control. So where is the most productive places that I could put my time? And that's on ensuring that Bitcoin users are more aware of the trade-offs, that tools that are helping Bitcoin users maintain financial privacy are getting supported, uh, that those developers are getting feedback, that they're getting funding, um, that users are getting education. That's why the focus is there is because I've already come to the conclusion that with or without me, with or without you, with or without anyone in this room, Bitcoin will be the money of the world. So it's up to us to make sure that it's actually freedom money and not cuck money. And privacy isn't just important to avoid uh, state capture around rules that we can and can't use it for. It's just a fundamental right. Right, but like, and even if you just do in general practice, I mean, we talked about HRF earlier. Mm. Like I met people who, you know, Parents were in jail for thinking things that were against the the Chinese the Chinese government, right? Yeah, like these are very real issues for people today. But even a, a real issue in the UK. But you, if you want to do a less, and we saw with the Canadian truckers, yeah. right? Their bank accounts were getting frozen. Well, GoFundMe was getting frozen. But one second, if we go back to even to just like a simpler, way way more fundamental transaction. If I'm getting paid in Bitcoin, and this is the thing, a lot of people that talk about these things aren't getting paid in Bitcoin. More and more of my income is Bitcoin, so I am getting paid in Bitcoin. If I'm getting paid in Bitcoin, my boss shouldn't know what I spend my money on. And the place, if I go buy a sandwich, like the sandwich shop owner shouldn't know how much I make. Like that is fucking ridiculous. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think for most people, if they see that, they have understand, especially the older generations, they've been using cash their whole lives. Unfortunately, the younger generations basically just chose not to use cash. They're used to that as a privacy setup for them, a basic financial privacy when it comes to transactions. But they're used to the fact that if they hand over cash, the person they're buying the sandwich of doesn't know where that Correct. cash went previously. Correct. Yeah, They're used to, if they spend on their card, again, they can't see that the... Instead, like 30 corporations are yeah. tracking you and selling your data and shit. In, in a different way, yeah. But but what I'm saying is... And the credit cards are surveillance cards as of, well. Of course, but what I'm saying, there isn't that connection. There isn't this Right, blockchain. the shop owner doesn't necessarily... Yeah, th there isn't. So that, that's a, there's a lot for people to learn. It's a big step. 100%. Go, yeah. And you know, I think Bitcoin becomes the money of the world. What I would say to you is, as a like a friend saying, I just don't know how many people are really going to make this effort. We've got, whatever, 3 billion, 3 billion on Facebook. They obviously don't care about privacy because they're on Facebook. Yeah, we know. Well, I mean, Facebook. I wouldn't say that, but yeah. Well, I think everyone's I think perfectly a lot of them aware. Are, no, I think a lot of them aren't aware of the trade-offs. Really? I think, I think people mean, are going to get burnt. Look, we've never been, in, in the greater digital privacy conversation, we've just never been in this situation before. Like people have never had this much of their lives digital. So what's going to happen is every year there's just going to be bigger and bigger leaks. Like people are just going to get more and more fucked. And as that happens, it will become more obvious to people. But I think the overwhelming majority of people that have like an Alexa in their home or whatever, they don't, they don't think of it as a surveillance device. They don't think like, oh, shit, that random conversation I had with my wife, you know, three months ago got leaked because some hacker, you know, stole it from Amazon and pushed, put, posted on the Internet. But I do think these hacks and these uh, uh, devices, people are becoming more aware. Yeah, they are, but they're not yet. I think some, I, but I think there's like uh, an ambivalence to it sometimes as well. Like it's that almost an acceptance. All right, fuck, I'm being tracked everywhere. I just like accept, like I accept Google. I mean, like I like. see it every time, every time a new hack up happens, a new leak happens, uh, you see more and more people start to take steps to improve their situation. It happens every time. Does everybody do it? No. It's hard But as well. there's, you know, maybe 5% of the people that are affected. And the thing is, it's not even just the people that are affected. Like, um, if your father or your neighbor or someone has their identity stolen, gets completely fucked, like, that's a wake-up call for you as well, right? Yeah. 
it, it's it's a hard transition. I've been I've tried it a couple of times. Like there's been times where I've gone to like DuckDuckGo instead of right. they're, they're fucked now as well again, aren't they? They're a little bit, yeah. yeah. But they're still significantly better than uh, than uh, Google. Google yeah. um, but the results kind of suck. Yeah, because um, they don't spy on you yeah. as much. They just kind of suck. Um, mm. You have it with your phone when you start. You know, if you choose not to have, say, an iPhone, say you want uh, one of the Android phones. De Google the Android. Yeah, and then there's trade offs. Everything has trade offs. Yeah, At the core of the privacy conversation is the main trade off is convenience versus privacy. Of course. If you want the most convenient situation, it probably comes at the sacrifice of privacy. But the beauty, like the beauty of Bitcoin is one of the beauties of Bitcoin to me is that on the trade off balance of security and convenience, Bitcoin goes way on the security side. And you see this with Chitcoin land, right? Where you see yeah. like super centralized chains like Solana that have cheap fees. Um, that maybe have more user-friendly stuff uh, involved because they're centralized, that's at the sake of security and robustness, right? And Bitcoin has chosen the opposite because it's a main protocol, right? It's the it's a protocol layer. It needs to survive everything else. Otherwise, well, we're, we're just building on quicksand. To me, you have this base protocol and then you have all these different ways of interacting with it on top of it. And there's going to be trade-offs along all of them. Um, and the cool part is for the first time, in human history, you basically can use this money protocol with the trade-off balance that you choose to use it. If I want to use dollars today, I don't have many options. I have, I can use cash, um, I can use credit card, or I can use the digital payment apps. And there's really not that much, there's a big trade-off difference between cash and the two digital payments, but whether you're using a Visa card or an Amex or Venmo or PayPal or Revolut, it's basically, you're basically in the same exact type of trade-off situation. What about stable coins, same? I mean, I would say, you know, stable coins obviously have a bunch of different trade-off balances. Yeah. Most of them are just straight up pegged, uh, you know, an issuer like Circle or Tether is holding money in the bank. And they say one to one, if you have the token, you know, you're trusting us and, and you take that. Um, they obviously have, but if you compare that, so you compare that to Bitcoin and, and you're getting some convenient factors in that it's attached to a money that is currently the most desired money in the world, which is the US dollar. Um, you're getting fast transactions, you're getting low fees. And, but then your your trade off is you're not getting censorship resistance, right? You're you're trusting this third party. This third party is going to get regulated. They're kind of in this you know little, uh, they're in this grace period where they haven't been fully regulated like a PayPal has, um, but they will. That will happen. Um, but they give you a different trade off balance than something like PayPal and Venmo. And then Bitcoin's over here gives you a different trade off balance. But my point is with Bitcoin, users will be able to use it completely regulated, not censorship resistant at all. They'll be able to use it on the full other extreme where they'll be able to use it privately, sovereignly. No one can tell them how to use their money, how to hold their money. And then there's going to be a bunch of different variations in the middle that you're going to be able to choose from um, rather than have, you know, a couple large payment corporations that are all basically following the same rules that are set from above. And in the world, if you want to talk about fairness, I mean, obviously I'm American, so I've been talking about U.S. regulators, but you know, U.S. regulators basically dictate how everyone else in the world gets to use their money, right? Like when yep. we talk about KYC rules, there's KYC rules for exchanges. The reason BitMEX went down, even though they were based in the Seychelles, is because it wasn't enough for BitMEX to say, Americans, you're not allowed to use it. America wanted them to take the identity information of every single person in the world just to make sure they weren't American, right? So, so there's a... There's not just a sovereignty question for individuals here. The current financial system poses a sovereignty question for every single country on earth and their citizens. So you're just the rulers of all of us, motherfuckers. Exactly. So someone like myself who, you know, is a little bit ambivalent to things like this, you know, maybe I've had this like negative attitude where I've been previously, oh, I just, I know I'm going to fuck something up. I'm, I'm going to get something wrong. What's your starting point? You, you said, all right, get the stuff exchanged. custody. I'm doing that, right? Yeah. I'm set up, deep cold storage, multi-sig. 
cool. I'm completely protected. Right. But what next? Well, I would say you skipped a step with multi-sig. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I actually did... What's, I, the, what's the step I've skipped? Single sig. Well, yeah, like, but, I, yeah, think, but I, I think I went on that journey though, didn't I? But I think that multi sig for most people might be overkill. Okay, but uh, if you're a public mm-hmm. figure, it makes sense to have multi sig um, because you don't want a single point of failure. But for most people, it could be overkill, and you're doing the same thing. It's convenience versus security trade off. Instead of a convenience versus privacy trade off, you're doing a convenience versus security trade off, right? Mm-hmm. And the scary thing about that though is. The convenience you're leaving is there's no customer support line for Bitcoin. So if you overcomplicate the way you store your Bitcoin, it's more likely you will lose it. Nine, you know, nine times out of ten, it, it's people losing Bitcoin themselves rather than it getting stolen. Um, so so people should be careful about that trade-off balance, and at least in terms of multi-sig. Actually, that's why I prefer multi-sig. Though I'm less likely to fuck up than a single sig. It could be. I mean, I I, I assume you're using a hosted multi-sig, right? Yeah, I'm not gonna. Talk about what I'm doing. Right, but I, so if you use like a Casa or an Unchained, which is the, you have like a third party that has a key, the, and they're like walking you through it, and they're making sure you don't make any user mistakes. Uh, obviously, you're giving up privacy for that peace of mind. Uh-huh. Um, if you're doing it yourself, there are just there are little things that you you may fuck up in terms of actually. Like right now, if you do a multi-sig setup, you need to keep, you need, it's not just the seeds, those secret words that you, that, that people use to back up their Bitcoin. You also need to have the, you need the information for all, all of your keys. So you're able to bring it back together. I'm not going to say the word, you know, you need the X pubs of each key. The what? <laughs> you need the X pubs of each key in order to bring it back together. So you have more information that you need to store properly. What's the next one? Um, people can go back to our last episode if they want to learn uh, what an XPUB is, or they can listen to my show, Citadel Dispatch, and their favorite podcast app. But you need more information to do the multi-sig. And so there's more places where you can make a mistake or you can fuck something up and you lose your money. Now, I don't want to scare people out of using multi-sig. I don't want to scare people out of trying to use Bitcoin more privately. Baby steps. And But my point is... I don't know if for most people, if if the best step is, okay, you come out and then you prioritize multi-sig. If anything, I would say maybe get more comfortable on single sig, get more p- comfortable with privacy tools on Bitcoin, play around with the Lightning Network, understand that a wallet is not just a single balance, that it's really a bunch of UTXOs that all come together that you can think of as like bills in your wallet, right? And learn how to use coin control and labeling and actually okay, I received this Bitcoin from Pete. I received this Bitcoin from Danny. I received this Bitcoin from, you know, Coinbase. And Coinbase, I know, is completely tracked to my identity, so I don't want the Bitcoin that comes from Danny or the Bitcoin that comes from Pete to be attached to my Coinbase Bitcoin. So... How are they, how are they attached? What if you do a spend that uses both of those UTXOs? Yeah. So when you, when you spend Bitcoin, your wallet might show you a set balance, but... It's really a bunch of little balances yeah. mixed yeah. together. And if when you're spending, it's more than any of those individual things that make up. So like if, if your balance is 15 sats, just for easy math, and you have a bunch of two sat transactions in there and maybe a couple four sat transactions and a five sat transaction, and you want to make a eight sat transaction, you're going to have to combine a bunch of those together to make that transaction because you don't have one that is eight sats. You need you need to add the two and the six or the two fours in order to get to the eight. But for convenience, most people are going to be using the wallets that just doesn't do the that. The wallet just does them. that in the background. Yeah. That's just how the Bitcoin protocol works. But the a lot of wallets will just do that in the background. And when they do that in the background, what's happening is they're linking those transactions with each other. So if you receive a transaction that is linked to your identity and then you receive one that isn't, and then in the future they get combined together and spent, not only do those both become linked to your identity, but also wherever you spent it, it becomes linked to your identity, right? Uh So understanding at the base level how wallets work, the thing is, one of the, two of the things here is first of all, education is obviously super important, but 
improving the tools so that we don't need as much education. The tools actually implement best practices as much as possible, that they imp- implement UX things that make it clear to the user that, oh, it's not just a single balance. Oh, this is you know, how it's working. Oh, these are labeled. I know that I got these payments from, from these people. And anyone listening wants to learn about UTXOs, I did, I did a show with Shinobi. I don't normally um, do callbacks to previous shows, but actually it was a brilliant show to understand UTXOs. So people should uh, go and check that one out. I think Danny will put that in the show notes with the show number. Um, but this comes back to that point of uh, convenience. Convenience versus, versus privacy. Privacy and kind of security as well in that uh, it's a lot easier just to grab a hardware wallet that does it all for you. And you've got to send something to an address and you send it and it picks it out for you thinking through every single UTXO that comes in and labeling it, and then when you want to spend, you're using Concontrast. So again, it's just a lot of work. And I would say is, first of all, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah. Try and improve your situation. I mean, for a lot of people, just holding their own Bitcoin keys in the beginning seemed insurmountable. Now they're very comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Um, Bitcoin is a movement of, of personal responsibility. It's it's gonna it comes down to the individuals. No one can force people to do anything. And and it's if they want to seek out the tools, if they want to learn how to use them, then ideally we want to have them there. And I would just say that people should just get their feet wet. Just get comfortable, slowly come into it, slowly try and improve your understanding. Be humble enough to understand that none of us really fully understand how Bitcoin works or how to use Bitcoin that we can always improve our setup, myself included. You can always improve. Uh, most of the shit I've learned about Bitcoin is just because I made many mistakes along the way, and then you you learn from those mistakes. But um, it, I, it's just it's important to realize that you you need to be there. There is a degree of of be prepared before you actually need it because if if when it comes time. So I mean, I was talking to. I was talking to Roy, uh, uh, who has a, who's been operating a Bitcoin company in Afghanistan since 2010. She pays all her employees in Bitcoin, and they're all women. They're all, you know, uh, pushed out of the traditional banking system. They're not able to access. Uh, they're not able to access their own bank accounts. They need a family member or a man to open a bank account for them. And since and since since 2010. Um, She's been, I guess, I think her, her company started in 2010 and in 2013, they started using Bitcoin and she started paying them in Bitcoin. Taliban come in, they take over. They take the, their, their, the full financial system, everything that had been built up over the years was completely decimated, basically overnight, cut out from the rest of the world. Those women were prepared for that situation. They were ready for that situation. She had a friend who was a well-connected politician um, in the post-Taliban, pre-Taliban era, and he never understood Bitcoin. He was like, it doesn't make any sense. I have this full financial system, financial system at my fingertips. I can pay anyone anywhere. The UX is great. It's super convenient for me. Taliban take over, he loses everything. All of his assets, he has to flee his home with just a backpack. Um, and after that, he realized the importance of Bitcoin. But he wasn't, I mean, he lost everything. So people will realize the need for this stuff eventually. The question is, how many people are actually going to be prepared before they need it and don't get absolutely wrecked? And how many people... Are, are going to be the opposite and they're just going to have to lose everything before they realize the need for it. So back to my last point though, whether it's single SIG or multi-SIG, yeah, that's one of the first recommendations. Get your Let's just keep a single SIG for, for ease of use or ease of explanation. Uh, someone's bought their ha- hardware wallet, they've moved their Bitcoin from the exchange. Where do you take people next? What are the next, you know, one thing I've never done, you're probably going to look at me and say, well, I've never done a coin join. Right. I mean, everyone's aware of that. Yeah. I've still never done one. Is that something that I should be, should I be moving it to one wallet and then doing a coin join and from the coin join to a new wallet? I think you got to play with the tools. You got to use the tools and play with the tools and, and get comfortable with it. Like no one knows how to do these. So when you're talking about tracking Bitcoin, the whole thing is a probability game. So everything... 
every transaction that you make in Bitcoin is on this ledger we call it the blockchain. That ledger isn't saying, you know, Matt sent Pete money. It says this address, uh, this these addresses came in on the input side. Sometimes they'll just be one address. But like we said earlier, sometimes if you need to combine them, your wallet will put multiple addresses there. And then on the outside, there's usually either one, it either goes to one address or it goes to two. And when it goes to two, it's usually one is the payment and one is the change coming yeah. back to your wallet. Now, there are these surveillance companies, these mercenary surveillance companies, they call themselves chain analysis companies. They are surveilling all Bitcoin users. They're using the KYC information, all this identification information you provide when you use a service to basically connect these addresses to real life individual names. Um, they'll use other external surveillance like IP addresses and stuff. If you go to websites, this is why the whole digital privacy conversation kind of comes into it. Um, to link all those addresses to names. Once they do that, the thing is with Bitcoin, unlike something like PayPal or Venmo or Cash App, you can actually send yourself Bitcoin. So like I could just keep sending myself Bitcoin, right? The protocol allows me to do that. So their job basically is they have all these people that they already know which addresses are theirs and how much Bitcoin they own. Their job is every time a transaction is made to have a probability of did that actually switch hands? The first step is, did that actually go to someone else? And the second step is, okay, if it went to someone else, who did it go to? So when you're talking about Bitcoin privacy, the whole play of a successful Bitcoin privacy is that probability gets shattered, that they just are not able to have high probability uh, estimations or guesses on when Bitcoin changed hands and who it changed hands to. So... The core of every Bitcoin privacy conversation is that. And that's why one main thing that people talk about is, okay, avoid KYC services. If you avoid a service that you hand your full ID over to, if if you just are earning Bitcoin and people are paying you Bitcoin rather than using a regulated service, and if you're just spending Bitcoin instead of selling Bitcoin at a regulated service, you remove that whole ID information from the beginning part. Okay. You just make all of a sudden your job is a lot easier as someone trying to use Bitcoin privately. And their job is much more difficult. Then it comes down to, okay, let's say you fucked that up already and you you bought whatever Bitcoin we're talking about. You bought it from a regulated service and you gave them full ID information. Then the question is, okay, how do I break this probability? They'll always know those surveillance companies, all their partners, governments they work with, authoritarians they work with, other corporations, anyone that information leaks to, will always know you had this much Bitcoin at this time. But if you break those probabilities going forward, they don't know necessarily what you spent it on and they don't know how much Bitcoin you have in the future, right? If five years go on and you've made 2,000 transactions and the probability of, of, of you handing it over to someone else is just that whole probability graph is broken, you're in a way better situation, right? So when we talk about CoinJoin, at its core, CoinJoin is a collaborative transaction. So instead of instead of just your, your inputs being on the input side, instead of you know your two inputs coming in to pay those eight sats, you really have five people come in with you at the same time. And on the outside, five people go out at the same time. And all of a sudden, and that those can be any numbers. I'm just using mm -hmm. five as an example because that's what Whirlpool uses which is one of the popular coin join wallets, but you do that and all of a sudden you're breaking that probability analysis, right? There's other ways to break probability analysis. Uh, there's something called pay join, which is another collaborative transaction where the sender and the receiver both provide an input. And then on the outside, they each get an output. Um, and those look like a normal transaction while a coin join, because it has many participants, is pretty obvious on chain. So these things together, all of a sudden, you start breaking this probability graph. So I would say the first step is basically getting comfortable with this as a concept, getting comfortable with this. Why is a coin join obvious? Because when I, if I just send you a naive Bitcoin transaction, it's you know a couple inputs on this side and then there's two on the outside. I'm paying you and I'm taking my change. Everything they use is heuristics. If I do a coin join, the most common type of coin join right now is, you know, if there's like five of us here and we're all doing a coin join, let's just say there's two, 
you can do a coin jump with two people. Me and you both put in equal amounts. So on the input side, it'll be equal amounts. And on the output side, it'll be equal amounts. And you see that, you can guess it's a coin join. Now, it could be someone coin joining with themselves. I could just put all my own inputs in. Um, but the point is a coin join type transaction happened there. Um, and if you use external, if you use other chain data, depending on how the person did it, you might be able to tell that they used their own funds rather than had different sources of funds. Danny, is it Whirlpool that you used? Uh, no, Wasabi. Wasabi. Yeah, so both Whirlpool and Wasabi, they have differences, um, but they both use these equal, equal amounts. So you have equal amounts on the input side and you have equal amounts on the output side. So it's, it's obvious on chain. See, I think, I, think, I think what will end up is a world of two Bitcoiners types generally. I'm going to be quite generic here. And you're going to encourage me to jump from one to the other. But there will be the person who acquires their Bitcoin on a KYC exchange. They use a, whether it's a ledger, a treasure, or a cold card to store that Bitcoin. And when they spend it, they will just spend and they just probably won't do the ma- much of this. And then there's going to be the people to go down the kind of privacy rabbit hole and, and they start looking at all these different things and start Im- improving things and maybe coin joining and et cetera, et cetera. But, but I do think there's a world where there's just a lot of people who will do things that probably you don't like, like keep on exchange, use they custody services. They to of do. course, of course. But it's, it's, I wonder if it's a, if what kind of minority it is that actually go on this journey and, and whether these things end up becoming baked in so it makes life a lot easier for people. And how, how important is it? Do, do, like, is it important that we have 20, 30, 40% of people doing stuff like this? Or does it just not matter? It's just all It does right. matter. So um, first of all, it's a little bit too technical for this conversation, but try me with, with Wasabi, it's a, a, there's a bunch of differences between Wasabi and Whirlpool, but with Wasabi, not all the input side are the same amounts, but on the output side, everything is the same amounts. So that's the key. The key is like on the output side and Wasabi specifically is like a 99 person transaction. So there's, you know, 80 outputs uh, that are all the same amount, right? Very, very obvious on chain. Anyway, um, the way I look at it is actually is most people, they're going to, as Bitcoin becomes more of a standard, people are going to realize the privacy thing is important. They're going to realize, you know, I don't want to pay someone and have them know exactly how much money I'm holding, of course. how much I make. Um and I already see that firsthand because people know that I'm aware of how a lot of this shit works. So when people pay me, they're worried about giving up information when they pay me. They're worried about that I'm going to look back on the chain and, and see what they do. And you know what they do? They pay me from a regulated service. They pay me from a cash app or a strike because it's not connected to their, their savings stash, even if they're self-custodying. I didn't do that with you. Did you go and look me up? I look everybody up <laughs> after you they me pay up? me. Yeah. Matt. You should tell me what you found out. Oh, God, sorry, you carry on. Did you really look well, me when up? When did you pay me Bitcoin? Your wedding. Oh, yeah, I did. You looked me up. <laughs> yeah. You can tell me what you found out afterwards. Yeah, we'll talk about that afterwards. Talk about that afterwards. Um, going back to like the sort of start of this conversation, um, if you could, if you like think that Bitcoin could be captured like from a regulatory standpoint, do you think that it can be a fungibility issue in terms of the people that are trying to transact privately? Yeah. So, I mean, the concern is that the concern is ultimately privacy loves company. Mm-hmm. So if we don't have that many users using Bitcoin privately, then you stand out like a sore thumb. And like, I'll be extreme about it, but if there's like five of us using CoinJoin, then you know anyone who uses CoinJoin is those five people. Yeah. Right. You need you need a group of people to basically blend in with. Um, and on top of that, there's a separate thing here where, you know, the reason the war on drugs wasn't successful, even though it was 40 years of criminalizing drug users, was because there were so many people that chose to just use drugs in a sovereign way without their government. Right. Mm-hmm. Um if most people had just rolled over and, you know, 98% people were like, well, you know, it's a crime. I'm not going to do it. 
it's too difficult for me. I can't go down to the street corner and buy some weed with cash. It, weed would still be illegal in America, right? It never would have become legalized. And the key was that there was a normalization of acquiring weed privately. Um, there was a normalization of going back against these draconian laws. In so, Bitcoin right now, it's the opposite. In the Bitcoin right now, the overwhelming majority of people are just like, it is what it is, just rolling over, yeah. just just handing handing full privacy out the door to to these exchanges, to these governments that are forcing the exchanges to do these things. Regulatory clarity, we need to do that. Now, I don't think that's a doomed sentence. I think what happens is the pendulum will shift, everyone will get burned, and people will start to learn, right? And people will come back. But anyway, the point I was trying to make earlier is that the thing I expect and the thing that is probably the most dangerous is that people will realize they need privacy, but they're used to their credit cards, they're used to PayPal, they're used to Revolut, they're used to Cash App. And as a result, they just, I call this custodial privacy. They give the privacy over to the regulated entity. So, okay, you know, Strike knows my information. Uh, Strike knows my transactions and my balances. Uh, potentially strike is, has to provide this information to whatever my government is if they ask for it. But I, I trust strike. And as a result, I use them and anyone I pay or anyone who pays me isn't able to see into my financial history. And that is how the majority of people will use it. Um, and I'm, then you're, you're, intro, you're introducing a centralized third party into the whole equation for the sake of privacy, and then all of a sudden you don't have that censorship resistance element to Bitcoin. And with regards to Wasabi and Whirlpool, how do I how do I know to trust them? Because I know there's like, for example, I've seen arguments online with regards to say Samurai. Is it that you give them your XPub? Well, the number. Oh, so you do know what an XPub is? <laughs> I had that one just to impress you, but you do. But they um, take your XPub, right? So no, you don't wanna... for some users they do. Yeah. So. But why did they do that, by the way? Okay, so first of all, CoinJoin is uh, CoinJoin is not a custodial relationship. CoinJoin is a native Bitcoin send transaction on the network that is a collaborative transaction. So you're doing it with multiple people. CoinJoin, you, you're never trusting someone with your keys. They can never take your Bitcoin, spend your Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay, you're just basically doing this group transaction with a bunch of people but you always are keeping custody. Where do you do it? Like, is there a tool you do it? Your with wallet it? is doing it, right? Which, yeah, but like, but what I'm saying is, where do you, like, if you want to go and do a coin join? Yeah, you like press. Okay, so like you open, uh, I, so I'm wearing my Sparrow, my Sparrow yeah. hat. Sparrow's on computer. Um, they use Samurai's Whirlpool protocol, right? So you open Sam, or you open Sparrow, um, you basically choose which UTXOs, you choose which Bitcoin you want to go through coin join. You press go into coin join. And then it's hitting the internet, right? And it's waiting to see if there's other people that are, are also ready, ready and, and waiting and a transaction is constructed and the wallets are going back and forth with each other and signing the transaction. And then all at once, the single transaction goes out. That is not, no one's actually taking custody. So you're signing a transaction that's okay. I'm putting in one input, he's putting in one input, five people are each putting in one input, and then you're signing the destination addresses, and you know you control one of the destination addresses, but no one else knows which one you control and which one someone else controls, and you're signing it all at the same time. So it's not a custodial relationship. What you are trusting with Samurai and Wasabi is there's this aspect... <laughs> And this is a very deep hole that we're going into right now, but there's this thing called Sybil attacks, which is the main thing, uh, the main type of attack scenario that you could see in these types of collaborative transactions. Is that where someone like um, Chain Analysis comes in and they try and you become think, part of it? You think you're doing a collaborative transaction with four other people, yeah. but really those four other people are chain surveillance companies. Yeah. That's the most extreme, right? Yeah. Now, the way Samurai and Wasabi get around that threat is that for those for those for an attacker to do that they're going to spend a lot of bitcoin yeah. because they have to spend this coin join fee and as they spend the coin join fee they're going to run out of money it's going to cost them a shit ton of money and if you're an honest user you just keep you keep going into coin join rounds it won't cost you nearly as much specifically with samurai the way samurai has it set up if you're trying to flood rounds it's going to cost you significantly more money than if you don't flood rounds 
if you're just using it like an honest user would use it. The thing is, because they're the ones taking the fee that stops the Sybil, that stops the flooding, it doesn't protect against them doing the flooding. So okay. Samurai Wasabi could be flooding the rounds. Okay. Cause, okay. Because they're paying themselves, so it doesn't really cost them any money. So if they're captured and we don't know. Then they're paying themselves and then they can de-anonymize the rounds. Okay. Right? Now, there's another tool called Join Market that doesn't have that centralized party. It's just two people inter, inter, but join market interacting with it's, each other. It's Join Market, isn't it? It's like it's a new. No, no, it's older. Is Join it old, Market's old, from like 2014. Okay. Um, or maybe 2015 now, but, uh, yeah, join market doesn't join market sacrifices convenience for more robustness. Right. So it's the same trade-off model, but anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, sidetracked here. Um, so, so neither whirlpool or Wasabi's implementation protects against the people running the coordinator software that is connecting the people because they're the ones taking the fees. They're the ones protecting against civil attacks, and they can't protect against civil attacks from themselves, um, unless there's high Bitcoin mining fees. But we just haven't seen high Bitcoin mining fees because every transaction you still have to pay mining fees. But in a low fee environment, you know, there's there's very little civil resistance from the actual parties. Now, once again, we're probably getting too deep in here. When we talk about Bitcoin privacy, avoiding KYC, avoiding linking your ID to your Bitcoin transactions, probably number one, self-custody is number two. And these are not mutually exclusive. Like uh -huh. even if you don't avoid KYC, you're still better off using self-custody. The third one maybe is coin control, understanding your UTXO balances. The fourth one is probably using your own node. And I actually have, so like my, one of my podcasts is still dispatch. There's an episode 43 where I literally just go two and a half hours with this guy, Bitcoin Q and A, and we just go through from start to finish acquiring Bitcoin, storing Bitcoin with privacy in mind for a beginner focused audience. But I would, I think I would say step four or step three, whatever fucking step we're at, is using your own node. And that's because to interact with the Bitcoin network, you have to use your own node. And if, if you have to use a node, and if you don't use your own node, you're, you're using someone else's it. node. And if you're using someone else's node, you're trusting them with your privacy. Mm -hmm. Now, most wallets today that people use you use a company's node. You're not using your own node. So yep. you, Ledger, Trezor, yeah. you know, I think, uh, MetaMask on Ethereum, all of these wallets are all basically using a company's node. And that company can spy on you. Cold card, you can use your own node, right? All of these wallets, you can use your own node as well. Yeah. Like Sparrow, for instance, supports every hardware wallet. Yeah. And then you can use it with your own node. But the point is, out of the box, when you get it out of the box, you like hook it up with Ledger Live, or you open a blue wallet on your phone, you're using a company's node. And that company can track your transactions. Same deal with Samurai. With Samurai, you have two options. You can use your own node or you can use their node. And it, by default, it uses their node. So if you use their node, they can see all your transactions. And if the majority of people that are doing the collaborative transaction are using their node, then even if you're using your own node, presumably there could be a uh process of elimination to figure out which transaction is yours because the majority are using their node and is that where all the arguments regarding samurai is this pretty what much been yeah. About? yeah it comes down to that and my belief is that um you know the way samurai whirlpool is set up is it's set up so if you have it running 24 7 you're getting all these free coin joints that happen and i think the majority of people that do that are using their own node because if you're running that software 24 seven, you're probably technically proficient enough to understand the importance and to be able to run your and use your own node, right? So I think the majority of those people are using their own node, so it's not really a concern to me, um, but that's what the whole concern comes down to. If you're not using your own node, the wallet can spy on you. Most wallets are already doing that, but with Samurai specifically, it's a privacy focused wallet. It could potentially be used to de-anonymize people that are using their own node when they're Doing coin join that that's what that whole argument comes down to. Can can you um can you have coin control if you're using multi sig? Yes, you of can. course. Yeah. But you the, can have coin control. But does it setup. depend on the service you're using? Like if you're using yeah, Unchained so like Unchained doesn't have coin control. I believe Casa does. Last time I used it, they didn't have labels. The labels are important. Yeah, 
because it's one thing to know, okay, I have UTXOs that are like two, four, eight sats, 10 yeah. sats. But if you don't know which what which one is which, it's completely use it's pretty much useless information for you. So when you receive a transaction, you want to be able to label it. Um, so yeah, it depends on the software. Once again, Sparrow has that. And I would also say that Samurai conversation has changed a little bit since Sparrow has added um, Whirlpool. As more wallets, Whirlpool is designed so wallets can implement other wallets can implement it. And for instance, on uh, on Sparrow, he doesn't run his he doesn't run a node for the users so if you load up sparrow and you don't want to use your own node um you're using a random electrum node okay that he has like a list of a bunch of electrum nodes and you're using that node so it further splits up the nodes that are seeing into these coin join transactions that are happening and that's basically what you want you want to see as much diversity in the collaborative transactions so that one party can't necessarily unwind them right and if you want to acquire bitcoin but your advice is avoid kyc uh, yeah exchanges um which a lot of people won't and if you can't earn right. it how can you acquire KYC? well i say earning it is probably going to be the way most people but right now like if you were right, like, right. i want to buy a bunch but i'm trying to avoid a kyc exchange for whatever reason are there are there ways to acquire bitcoin relatively easily now kyc free look i think uh i i everything has trade-offs and and the goal shouldn't be perfection once again because if if the goal is perfection you're just going to overwhelm yourself and say uh -huh. oh, i'm already fucked so for some people what that might look like is okay um you know i'm a high net worth individual i have a million dollars i want to deploy into bitcoin or something uh, I can't do that, you know, in a private fashion. So I'm just going to go to Fidelity or Coinbase or Gemini or whatever and do a bank transfer. Okay, that that might make sense, but you know, you should still consider maybe having a, a smaller position that is a private position, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe you have, you know, you have some that is your 401k that's like fully shown to the to whatever government you're under, a bunch of corporations, all these different things. But then you also have, uh, you know, like your fuck around stash or your your freedom stash, right? Mm -hmm. um, the proverbial, uh, you know, duffel bags of cash in the walls of Tony Soprano's house, right? Now, the if it's smaller amounts though, so that's like if it's a very big high net worth person, someone trying to, you know, they use the words deploy and capital and shit when they're uh -huh. buying Bitcoin. Um, for the average person, what we see, so we see this in America and it's true in other places in the world as well, is we see a lot of these lower income working class people that are kind of, they're more or less cut out of our traditional financial system. They have a lot of trouble um using the payment apps uh, i mean like cash app specifically has done really well in terms of lower income communities that get cut out of banks but people don't realize like even in america a lot of people get cut out of the traditional system um i think roya said something uh it was like three billion people in the world like half the population of the world is completely cut out of the financial system what a lot of them do in america at least is they go to these bitcoin atms mm -hmm. Now, the Bitcoin ATMs, you know, might have slightly higher fees. They might not allow you to do it completely anonymous. They, maybe they ask for a phone number or something. But it's significantly better than giving, you know, the blood of your firstborn child, your f photo, your full address, like all these other things, than even doing an ATM in a naive way without a burner phone, right? And just going to the ATM, putting cash in. You don't have a bank that knows about it, right? You're reducing those. You're re reducing those uh, data points, right? You're reducing that exposure. So a lot of people coming in through ATMs. A lot of those ATMs you can use with burner phones if you want to. But once again, like I said, even if you use your own phone number, is it ideal? Can it connect that phone number to a bunch of personal information? Yeah, phone numbers suck. Phone numbers are a fucking problem. It's it's definitely KYC, but it's better than than the established quo of using these regulated exchanges. Then you also have uh, these P2P exchanges. You have stuff like BISC, which is a network that you can use to trade Bitcoin with other people. Um, then there's HODL HODL, which is a company 
that does this. There's a couple more coming out. There's one called RoboSats that works pretty well. Um, that's completely in your browser. But these are all going to be for smaller amounts. They're not going to be for way larger amounts. Then you also have mining. Mining right now, you can buy. So I, that's what the, the next point I was going to ask. I, with my mining, my assigned things, uh, I send that to a new address. Exactly. But it's a new address within a wallet that has other addresses in well, it. Well, that's where the coin control comes in. But is there any way? So there's obviously I have my XPub and I have my sub addresses from it. See. He pretends he doesn't know where Nexpo <laughs> is, but he knows. Go on. I with told your sub you, addresses. I told, I, told, continue. I told you. Dinner. I know what it is. I just never think about it. Okay, continue. Um, is there a way of linking those sub addresses back to the X? Like, can, can they be linked? Like, if I have, like, five wallets. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're not using your own, everything has trade-offs. If you're not using your own node, right, who's ever node you're using knows they're linked. Okay. Because they've got, um, they've got access to my expert. Them, and maybe they won't share it out to the rest of the world, right? Because, because they have access um, to my expert. Right. Then if, if, uh, if you make a trend, but the rest of the world might not know if they keep that information to themselves. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's more risk analysis. But then if you make, if you make a transaction, obviously that combines those transactions, if it combines a KYC transaction with, with your mining transaction, then obviously those are linked together, right? You combine a transaction that's linked to your ID with a transaction that's not linked to your ID, then obviously uh, those are going to be combined uh, and linked together on chain and they'll know they're owned by the same person. Um, yeah, so mining, depending on where you live in the world and what your electricity rate is, in America specifically, electricity is way cheaper than the rest of the world, uh -huh. pretty much all else equal. Mining can be a very good way of getting... Uh, more private Bitcoin because uh, when you when you buy these miners for whatever reason you don't need to provide identification information right now. But say um, I, I bought my miners via Compass, so right. I have that additional layer there. Yeah, but there's different. There's different. Um, this is why the Bitcoin. So so when we were talking about it earlier, we were talking about. Um, that the cool part about Bitcoin to me is that people have a lot of different options with different trade-off balances, right? Yeah. The negative of that is there's no one-size-fits-all or easy way to explain the different pros and cons of all the different tools you can use. Well, it's overwhelming, Matt. That's what right. I think. Because there's, there's so many different scenarios, and each of those scenarios have different trade-off balances. So with something like a hosted mining option where you're buying miners, they're setting you up in a server farm somewhere that you don't have control over, obviously that is not as private or sovereign as you having miners in your own home, in your possession, especially from a not your keys, not your coins type of situation. But if you compare that to um, a regulated exchange buying Bitcoin on Cash App, for instance, if I buy Bitcoin on Cash App, a single company Cash App knows my ID information, they know my bank account information, they know how much Bitcoin I bought, and they know which address I sent to. If you use a hosted mining solution, they know you bought a miner, they know where it's hosted. Then you actually choose which pool you use. They don't run the mining pool. Then the mining pool... I run the mining pool. Right. But no, someone else is running a well, mining no, pool. I choose you connect. the mining yeah. Okay, so you choose your mining pool. That mining pool then knows your payout addresses. So those two companies basically need to collude to have the same amount of information that a cash app has, right? Uh -huh. You're splitting up you're splitting up that private information between two different companies and they'd have to combine together and work together or both get compelled by the same government or both have a data leak for the same amount of level information as you're providing a single regulated entity when you're using like a cash app. Now there are some mining pools this <laughs> is nuance. Some of the mining pools that are doing KYC, the largest mining pool in the world right now, Foundry, based in America, fully KYCs all of their users. So if you use Foundry, then you get absolutely no privacy benefit. It's the same exact thing. But mining will always be an option for people to accumulate private sats, private Bitcoin. Um, and like I said, I think ultimately a lot of this is a pain point of how early we are in the adoption cycle. Most people are going to be earning Bitcoin. They're not going to be doing, they're not going to be getting it from regulated exchanges. 
Um, and most people will be spending Bitcoin. They won't be selling it on regulated exchanges. They'll be going to the corner store and they'll just be spending Bitcoin. Um, so all of a sudden you take out a major pain point from the whole system. But the question is, how long does that take? Yeah, fair question. And with the Lightning Network, uh, if I'm spending Bitcoin, how much privacy do I have there? <laughs> I mean, so I did like a three hour Citadel Dispatch episode on that. You did? Um, well, what episode? We can go and listen. I, I think it's 21. Um, so, Hell yeah. So you're typing Citadel Dispatch on your podcast app. It's episode 21. Um, but yeah, just like Bitcoin, there's a lot of tr- there's a lot of different nuances and things. Um, in general, senders on Lightning have better privacy than receivers. Uh, so if you're a merchant or something, uh, particularly, I mean, we were talking about HRF. If you're a human rights activist and you're trying to raise funds uh, in an authoritarian environment under an authoritarian regime, uh, we saw this in Canada. Uh, if 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 you're trying to if you're trying to raise funds and that government's coming after you, you need to take care of privacy because if you don't take care of privacy, you're putting your donors at risk, but you're also putting yourself at risk. In Canada, they went after the people who were organizing the Bitcoin fundraiser. They couldn't take the Bitcoin. They did take the Bitcoin though. after they went to the guy's house and yeah. was like, put a gun to his head and said, "Give us the fucking Bitcoin, or you're going to jail." Um, I think to me, Matt, but that they, was... knew, they knew to pressure the person and they knew how much Bitcoin there was, right? Yeah. They didn't know where to find the Bitcoin and they didn't have a button they could press to take the Bitcoin, but they went through the privacy attack vector. We saw the opposite happen. Um, we saw the opposite happen in, in Russia, I guess it's not even the opposite, um, where Navalny, the main opposition to Putin, mm-hmm. has been raising Bitcoin donations for a long time. He reuses addresses. He doesn't even use Lightning. He doesn't even create new addresses. He reuses the same address over and over again. Putin pressured Binance and was like, let us know which users have donated to this address. And they just gave full KYC information. Really? They gave a list of everyone who donates to Navalny. Fucking hell. And some easy. of them have family in Russia. Some of them. And all these people were probably saying to themselves, you know, like, oh, what do I need to know about privacy? Like, oh, privacy is too difficult. Like, why should I fucking deal with it? Now they know. But now it's too late, right? They already got fucked. Like, you want to avoid that situation. But they'll never make that same mistake again. Their friends and family will never make that same mistake again. Um, so I guess the point I was trying to make there is there's an obligation if you're receiving Bitcoin and you and you want privacy, like you're going to have to go a little bit more effort, especially on the Lightning Network. Um, it's just not really set up well for receiver privacy. But on the sender side, um, on the sender side, so we'll go back to the Canadian. Uh, we'll go back to the Canadian example. Uh, if if you look at the blockchain data. Um, when the Canadians were raising Bitcoin donations, uh, you can tell everyone who donated on chain very easily. Yeah. The people that donated through Lightning, no. Okay. Right? So when you send, in general, the expectation is if you send Bitcoin via Lightning, um, the receiver doesn't know which UTXOs were used to make that payment. So you're like, you're breaking that chain of information as opposed to if, if you send on chain um there's a direct history of the chain data of all your transactions before it i think the uh, ca- canadian situation was probably the biggest um, example we've had so far of a massive overreach from a developed uh liberal western democracy to interfere in what should be considered the free right to protest um and that that was one of the one hey that was one of the ones that really stood out to me as okay now i see it yeah i mean i thought there was a moment there where i thought that was our terrorist moment i thought they were going to make us all terrorists no they were just going to call us all terrorists if you want to use bitcoin privately you're a terrorist and when i say that i don't mean me i mean you too like if you want to hold self-custody bitcoin then you're a terrorist. Well, uh, if you have to like send a form in and say, I own all this Bitcoin, this is where I own it. These are the transactions I made. Please, daddy, 
Let me be okay. And if you don't do that, you're a criminal. And I thought that was going to be our moment. They pulled back off the ledge at like the last second. Um, I was hoping it was going to be a bigger wake up call for people. Uh, people forget so quickly. Well, again, so that's, uh, that, I mean, that's the point. Like, <laughs> this is overwhelming, Matt. Yeah. And I'm aware what, it's overwhelming. Yeah. I don't pretend it's not overwhelming. Yeah. It's overwhelming. There's a lot to think about. And uh, I've always tried to represent what I think. A lot of people think rather than what people want me to think, right? Right. That's why I was chatting to P about last night. And uh, and it's overwhelming. There's a lot to think about. And I, my hope is in the future a lot of this is abstracted away for people. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. And, it's already more abstracted than it was before. Well, of course. I mean, look, uh, we are talking about it earlier, but um, when people were first using Bitcoin, they used the command line interface and then right. we had wallets. Okay, and now we have wallets with additional tools, and now you can connect. And like, there is this constant advancement. What things are coming on the privacy side that excite you uh, in a way that abstracts us away from people? Like, for example, so, I would I would love a wallet when an incoming UTXO comes in; it immediately goes to a whirlpool. Yeah. So, um, so it's just done. So, first of all, you're wearing this beautiful hat on your head. Yeah, it's my um, birthday. 1031 is is my venture fund, um, largest Bitcoin-only venture fund in the space. And part of our mission, we only invest in Bitcoin companies, Bitcoin-only companies, no shitcoin projects. Um, part of our mandate is that we also provide grants out of our fees to open source projects, no strings attached. And like to your listeners who may not understand the difference, with closed source projects, closed source projects are controlled and owned by a corporate entity or an individual. Open source projects are free, available for the world to modify, distribute, verify, check all the code that's running. These are this is Bitcoin's an open source project, and as a result, it's viral in nature. It outlives any individual, it outlives any corporation. It's extremely important when it comes to the freedom movement that we have strong open source projects. So with all that said, at 1031, we fund no strings attached open source developers that are working on interesting things. And one such project that we just gave a Bitcoin to uh, is called Fediment. And Fediment is this idea of a privacy preserving wallet that you can install on a mobile phone um, that is easier to use than any Lightning wallet that currently exists. Um, it has Basically, you have like a multi-sig of custodians. So you'll have like a group of custodians that are that are holding all the funds, but they can't take your money unless the majority of them decide to take your money. So you're you're hoping that they they won't all come together to steal all your money. You have privacy from them because they use something called Charmian eCash. And then you're able to pay any lightning invoice in the world or receive any lightning invoice in the world, regardless of what wallet they use. So in practice, what does that look like? That looks like you, Peter McCormick, installing this wallet on your phone, choosing which group of custodians you want to use. There'll be custodians around the world. They'll all compete with each other on fees and uptime and reputation because you need to have the wallet up and running and working and you don't want to pay that many high fees and you want to use someone that you could trust. Uh, that is not trying to fuck you over. And then you can just pay any Bitcoin invoice you see anywhere. And it will be done in, you know, with privacy best practices taken into account and you don't have to think of anything else. And so what's the trade-off there? The trade-off there is that you're putting some trust into that group of custodians to keep the wallet up and to not take your funds. Um, but as a result, you're getting a very convenient wallet experience that gives you very strong privacy guarantees that's cheaper and faster than a regular Bitcoin transaction. So all those incentives really line up really well. And they're a lot closer to releasing a first wallet than people realize. Um, so it's the single most excited thing I am. Excited okay. thing I am. The single most exciting project in Bitcoin for me right now okay. is this thing called Fediments. And uh, hopefully it'll mean that this whole coin join conversation we just had it's just, you know, ages horribly in a year and just not even needed. Um, it'll still be used by power users, larger amounts, all this other stuff. But if you're just like the average person, 
and you want to be able to just spend your Bitcoin privately, you know, you just load this mobile wallet, load it up with some Bitcoin, pay on will, pay at will. You have your separate savings wallet. Boom. Done. And if people want to learn more about privacy, like where would you say go? Apart from Citadel Dispatch, which you've promoted at least sure. 42 times in this show, which I advise people to go and check. No, I'm going to get it, but like where are good places to go and learn? Citadel what? What is that? Citadel Dispatch. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I mean, so when are you, when are you having Seth on? Uh, when's Seth coming? Thursday. Thursday. Two days. So like what, after this podcast releases, like in a couple days? Uh, I mean, the order we release this or the, that you don't one even doesn't matter. Know? I think this, no, this will go first. I think this, this will, will go first. first. Yeah. Okay. So after this comes out, there's going to be another show that comes out with Seth. Yeah. Um, Seth has his own podcast called opt out. That is really good. Uh huh. There's also a collection, uh, so definitely listen to that with Pete, but also listen to his podcast. It's just a really good podcast, and he's been on my show multiple times. I'm going to go on his show. Um, he's just a good dude. I, li- I like He Seth. means well, and he cares about privacy. He really cares about so privacy. So his point on achieving privacy with Bitcoin, his analogy to using PGP, I thought was very good because I've tried – Multiple times use PGP and I give up because I'm like, fuck, I, got, I can, don't fucking know what I'm doing here. And I yeah, just I, mean, there's, I, I think there's definitely a very strong lesson, um, particularly between PGP and Signal, right? Or even, yeah, like PGP and Signal. Like PGP is technically sound encryption um, protocol. So like if, if you want to send a message on, on the internet, regardless of your message medium, you can encrypt it with PGP. And um, a malicious actor that intercepts that is not going to be able to read your message. The problem was it was way too far on the privacy versus the convenience scale, right? And it yeah. just was never convenient enough for mass adoption to happen. Most people don't use it. I use PGP. It's not not even very few people. Not even it. just convenient, like <laughs> like the actual ability to to do it. No, I mean, there's software now. There's like. You can think of them as wallets that hold your keys that like will do it for you. There's mobile versions, um, but it's just not polished, right? Yeah. And and it's, to me, that's a cautionary tale, right? And then you see something like Signal um, that takes a different trade-off balance, but it's really polished. You just install it on your phone. It connects to a phone number, which a lot of privacy advocates would say phone numbers fucking suck. It shouldn't connect to a phone number. Um, but if you talk to the Signal team, they'll say, well... You know, WhatsApp had billions of users and they used phone numbers. iMessage has, you know, hundreds of millions of users and they use phone numbers. People just like using phone numbers as their communication method. Um, so we're going to do that, but we're going to do it with very strong encryption where you don't have to know like how it's working behind the scenes. That's also obviously re- relying on this open source principle where their software is open source. The server isn't, but you're not trusting the server because the client is encrypting it and that you can verify. Um, so there's definitely a lesson to be had there that I hope Bitcoiners are aware of. And I think we are. Um, and I think that could be handled on the app side. And that this is where like something like Fediment comes in. Like Fediment could be the signal privacy. And just because signal exists doesn't mean people can't use PGP. I talk to people using PGP all the time. You can still use PGP. Um, but you also have the option to do dead easy encrypted messaging that someone like yourself could use, right? That I can use with my mother. You know, I can use it with my grandmother. My grandmother's on Signal. Uh, I don't use PGP with her. Um, so that's definitely, there's there's definitely a lesson there. But anyway, my point was opt out, great podcast. Um, Bitcoiner, uh, Bitcoiner.guide uh, by Bitcoin Q&A has a bunch of great guides over there. Um, if you go to, actually, if you go to mattodell.com, I have a bunch of resources listed. Actually, citadeldispatch.com slash help mirrored as well there. But there's just a bunch of different guides uh, that you can go to. Um, Bitcoinprivacy.org is another collection of guides. There's a lot of resources out there. When I first got into Bitcoin, there was fucking nothing. Um, But it's not, I'm definitely not saying it's not overwhelming. I think the most important thing is not necessarily that people are perfect with privacy, is that they're aware that they're and leaking they information. I just want people, the most important thing that I hope that people get away from this conversation at least is, you know, you're just leaking. We're all leaking a ton of information. Myself, I'm not perfect. Try and do this. Yeah. I mean, 
I came here with a cell phone in my pocket. Like, um, you know, obviously I work for the British government. Part of the contract is that right. uh, we get spook for hire. We have to get the guests in that they want, and then we have to put listening devices in, and they want to to capture the conversations before we start the interview and afterwards, and and then uh, and they're going to follow you with the drone home. That's fair. There you go. You got some whiskey out of this. What? You I got some whiskey out of this. We here. didn't have one argument. Very disappointing. Yeah. I want to get back to the Christmas specials where we just fucking shout abuse mm-hmm. at each other. Anyway. Those are always fun. They are always fun. Matt O'Dell, thank you very much for coming on What Bitcoin Did. Appreciate you, man. Love you, man. It's Let's been a pleasure. Soon. It's always a pleasure. Always, man. Peace out, bro. Cheers.